TV News and Rescue Command Center. This is Y News with Angelo Castro III, Jerry Alcantara, and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. Malacanang clarifies the reported GO signal given by President Rodrigo Duterte on Mary Jane Veloso's execution in Indonesia. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. Malacanang clarifies that President Rodrigo Duterte did not give a GO signal to Indonesian President Joko Widodo on the execution of the OFW Mary Jane Veloso. According to Presidential Spokesman Ernesto Abella, the President did not give any direct statement regarding the matter. The President just informed us that his actual statement and conversation with President Widodo went like this. He said regarding Mary Jane Veloso, he said, follow your own laws, I will not interfere. End of statement. Malacanang refused to further comment on the issue regarding the case of Veloso as the President himself already said that he will not give any statement until he is able to talk to the Veloso family. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. Filipina death row inmate Mary Jane Veloso is set to testify against her alleged illegal recruiters soon. Joanano will tell us why. The case of Mary Jane Veloso, the Filipina death row inmate in Indonesia, will be rolled out again as she is set to give her testimony against her alleged recruiters very soon. Attorney Jocelyn Dainla, one of Veloso's legal counsel, says their client will testify against Maria Cristina Serio and Julius Lacanilao. The reprieve that the Indonesian government since last year is continuing to And they also said that uh, hintayin nila na makapagbigay ng testimony sa Mary Jane. According to Attorney Edre Olalia, the Secretary General of National Union of People's Lawyer, the group handling Veloz's case, that Mary Jane will tell her whole story, which they believe will help in the identification of the real culprits and perpetrators of this drug trafficking case. Currently, the case is still at the stage wherein the prosecution is presenting their evidences and her lawyers are confident that this will be a big help for Veloso to defend her case. Meanwhile, based on the latest statement released by NULP on the alleged ghost signal given by President Rodrigo Duterte on Veloso's execution, the group says they will hold on to the official statement that Mary Jane has been convicted and remains on the death row in accordance with Indonesia's own laws. The group also stands firm that her execution is postponed indefinitely to await the result of the cases in the Philippines against her alleged recruiters and traffickers. The NULP made a statement following the reports that an article from Jakarta Post says that Mary Jane's execution will be served as President Duterte has given his go signal to Indonesian President Joko Widodo. The group committed that they will continue to fight and defend Veloz's case and looking forward for Mary Jane to eventually come home in the Philippines. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Meanwhile, the government and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines will discuss ceasefire mechanisms in the next round of formal talks next month. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. While the government and the National Democratic Front both declared unilateral ceasefires, there were no common terms or conditions for its implementation. During the first round of formal negotiations in Oslo, Norway last month, the government and the rebels agreed to make the ceasefire permanent through a bilateral declaration. However, the parties have yet to discuss how this will be implemented and how to handle violations of the truce. NDF Peace Consultant Benito Tiamzon says this will be discussed during the resumption of talks next month. Magkakaroon ng ceasefire committee, pati yung mechanism for monitoring, pag-uusapan pa rin yun, ipipirmi pa rin. Said committee will be tasked to monitor the implementation and to resolve violations of the truce. Tiamzon adds the general amnesty for political prisoners as promised by the president will also be discussed at the resumption of Oslo talks. The rebels wanted the government to free all political prisoners listed by the NDF. Meron siyang commitment to release all political prisoners at uh, meron din commitment yung government panel 
na i-recommend nila yung amnesty at saka release ng political prisoners. Under the Constitution, the President has the power to grant amnesty but only with the concurrence of the majority of Congress. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Residents of Davao City are still coping with the effects of the bombing incident that rocked the city last September 2. Victor Cosare will tell us why. Three days after the deadly bombing, Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte Carpio has appealed to the residents of the city not to be cowed by the incident but instead to live a normal life. Business as usual for everybody. Hindi tayo magpapatakot sa mga terorista. Of course, nandun yung kaba, pero in, ang general feeling na kakuha ko sa mga tao, malungkot at galit, more than natatakot. Despite this appeal of the local chief executive, some residents still fear for their lives, especially that the perpetrator of the crime is not yet in police custody. Makul ba ang nilig kalaad daw? Oo, kaya ba sinig? O takamaloon sa paisunod ba itabuan na? Oo, madlok yun ka. For some, they only resort to praying before they go on with their daily life. Also, people who are frequent in the Rojas Avenue could attest to the fact that even if the night market still continues to operate, the number of people that goes to the area is a little less as compared to before. But authorities are still on alert to prevent a repeat of the tragic incident that killed 14 people and injured more than 60 others. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Davao City. PNP Chief Ronald De La Rosa wants to make sure that his men are equipped with the necessary skills needed during operations. Meanwhile, the PNP also strengthens its strategy in Metro Manila alongside those in the provinces. Marge Navarro will tell us why. And I am uh, announcing this to all the criminals. Beware, my policemen are practicing uh, enough. You better uh, run away or you better uh, stop what you're doing right now because our policemen are honing their skills, they're practicing. This has been PNP Chief Ronald De La Rosa's warning against criminals and drug personalities. De La Rosa stated that they will enhance the skills of police in using firearms to make their force stronger against criminality. They will be conducting a quarterly firearm proficiency test to the police and all those who will fail will be disarmed. Meanwhile, the Philippine National Police has come up with a contingency plan to beef up its security, not only in Metro Manila but also in the provinces, following a series of bomb threats that the agency has received. PNP Directorate for Operations Police Chief Superintendent Camilo Cascolan explains that in case a bombing takes place in any of Metro Manila's vital installations, reinforcement will be sent to areas affected by the explosion. Kung may pumutok dito, meron ng plano ang RD and CRPO. Who goes there? It's not from this one. Hindi mo pwedeng iwan ng MRT. Yes. Hindi mo rin pwedeng iwan ng SM. Hindi mo na pwedeng iwan ng bridges. Meron tayong mga tropa joint AFP and PNP that are actually going around. In a, in a certain por portion of EDSA, meron isang SRT dyan nakakaman. Naka naka Kaskolan says, entrance and exit points of a city or town affected by an explosion will be immediately closed and police officers from other places will not be allowed to interfere. The PNP will then send an augmentation force or a special response team consisting of regional office personnel, explosive and ordnance disposal or K-9 group, special weapons and tactics if needed. That is actually one of the ideas also of the chief PNP so that we would be able to quan, enhance our quan, our uh, response. Furthermore, the agency is asking for help from the public to be vigilant and to report any suspicious looking person or thing that they might see in their areas. March Navarro, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Senator Sherwin Gatchalian is pushing for the passage of the SIM card registration bill, seeking President Rodrigo Duterte's move to certify it as urgent. This is prompted by the series of bomb threats received in schools and public places within the last week. 
Gachalian sees this as a measure to immediately locate and capture individuals who spread rumors about bomb threats through text messages. Under the bill, a buyer must present a valid photo ID when buying a SIM card and the details such as the mobile number must be registered within 180 days, otherwise it will be deactivated. Gachalian assures that cellular data information will remain confidential and that the bill will not violate the people's right to privacy. The mandatory registration of SIM cards is implemented in many countries primarily to counter terrorism and support law enforcement efforts. The Senate minority proposes four bigger funds for the government's feeding programs for malnourished children. Aiko Miguel tells us why. Based on the report of the Save the Children, there is an estimated 171 million children who are stunted in the whole world. 3.6 Filipino children are stunted which makes the country ninth among countries with the highest number of stunting. In the recent Senate hearing, they have observed that the food budget for malnourished children is smaller than those of the prisoners. Senate Minority Leader Ralph Recto vows to increase the budget for feeding programs of DSWD and DepEd from a combined 7.62 billion pesos to 13.89 billion pesos in the 2017 national budget. In order for this to materialize, DSWD and DepEd needs an additional 6.3 billion pesos. According to Senator Recto, if there are additional funds for the salaries of government employees, children should well be prioritized too. Meanwhile, Vice President Lenny Robredo reiterates that malnutrition is alarming and it has to be solved. At present, there are millions of Filipino children who go through a day without eating. Since children who are stunted have poor physical and mental development, they are likely to become repeaters in school or drop out of school. According to the Department of Health, there are continuous programs to strengthen the prevention of malnutrition in the country. Uh, sa under 5, may growth monitoring chart kami. Sinasabi namin sa magulang kung ano mga dapat gawin, kung bansot dyan o kaya payatot. Uh, sa amin sa Department of Health, ang aming focus ay yung micronutrients yung kakulangan sa vitamin A, iodine, yung National Nutrition Council, yan, yun yan may programa sa mga feeding, katuwang nila dyan ang DSWD at saka DepEd. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. UV Express operators are asking the Land Transportation, Franchising and Regulatory Board to consider adding more routes in EDSA for UV Express vans. Monokson will tell us why. The Land Transportation, Franchising and Regulatory Board recently issued a memorandum circular allowing UV Express to traverse EDSA once again. But according to UV Express operators, the order is lacking in what has been discussed on the public consultation last week. According to the operators, the route Edsa Ortigas is not included in the memo circular. They said this will cause more complaints from passengers. Pano yung mga pasayero natin sa Ortigas? Wala po kami pagbababaan na malapit sa Ortigas. Uh, except po, doon kami sa likod dumaan, pero napakasigip na rin po. The LTFRB says the agency will conduct thorough study on the said route because it will just add to the traffic congestion in EDSA. The board amended the memo circular and allowed UV Express to traverse EDSA but must follow certain conditions. UV Express units coming from south of Metro Manila heading to Makati may take Skyway going to its terminal in Ducetani Hotel, De La Rosa Street, Gabriela Silang and other terminals in the Makati Business District. Those coming from Makati heading to South Luzon Expressway may take Arnaiz Street going to EDSA then go straight to Magallanes Interchange. UV Express coming from Fairview, Quezon City, Marikina and Pasig may take C5 Road to Aurora Boulevard in Cubao. Meanwhile, those going to Makati may take Kalaya and fly over to Bandia Avenue. UV Express coming from Northern Luzon entering Metro Manila will be allowed in Edza Balintawak, but they can only unload passengers up to MRT North Avenue Station and LRT Munoz Station. They will not be allowed to unload outside the terminals. The memo circular clarifies that no UV Express service may unload and load passengers at any point in EDSA. 
LTFRB warns it will penalize violators of the memorandum. Okay na kami sa okay. At, at least eh, may pinagbabawal man na bawaan, eh, hindi hirap. Kahit paano, kasi karamihan ng sakay namin talagang MRT, LRT. Mahirap tsaka matagal, naiipon din yung sasakyan sa Mindanao Ave. Eh. So, mas, mas lalong tumatagal. Mas okay ngayon. Mas okay ngayon. Monhok Son, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Motorists are experiencing light to moderate traffic on some major areas in Metro Manila. From Edson Nia Road, Monhok Son is back to tell us why. Yes, Mon. Good evening, Darlene. Commuters and also motorists are now experiencing light to moderate traffic around Metro Manila. Let us first check the traffic situation here in Edsania Road. Vehicles coming from Cubao will experience light traffic going to Edsa North Avenue. Moderate traffic will be experienced starting from SM North to Munoz. Meanwhile, vehicles going to Cubao from Munoz will also experience light to moderate traffic. And now, let's check the traffic situation from our live point in Letre Malabon. Motors going to C4 in Navotas will not encounter any problem. And also, all vehicles going to Mon Monumento will experience light traffic as, if, as of this moment. Let's check the situation along Commonwealth Avenue. Filcoa going to Fairview is light. And also, going Tandansora to Filcoa is also light traffic along Commonwealth Avenue. Let's go further south in Baclaran Ross Boulevard. Vehicles going to Manila will encounter mod moderate traffic and vehicles going to Coastal Road will experience light to moderate traffic as of this moment in Baclaran Ross Boulevard. Let's go check our live point in Edsa, Guadalupe. Traffic situation is different in Guadalupe because the traffic is heavy for southbound vehicles. Going uh, rather northbound vehicles going Shaw Boulevard but don't worry because vehicles from Orense going to Ayala southbound will experience light to moderate traffic. Let us check the live point in SM Santa Mesa. In SM Santa Mesa, moderate traffic going to Cubao area, while light traffic going to Santa Mesa for vehicles going to uh, the said area. Number coding is suspended uh, today because of the holiday but will resume tomorrow 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. All vehicles with plate numbers ending in numbers 3 and 4 is prohibited in all major roads in Metro Manila tomorrow. And that's our traffic update. Back to you, Darlene. Thank you, Mon. And that's Mon Oxon reporting live from Edsa Nia Road. Next in Y News. The Philippine Airlines bans the use of Samsung Galaxy Note 7 in all of its flights due to safety issues. The U.S. federal government marked its return to the rebuilt One World Trade Center 15 years after the 9-11 terror attacks. And China hosts Trade Expo to strengthen trade relations with ASEAN member nations. Y News will be right back. show of support to the Philippine government, Filipinos in Canada gather in Toronto to raise funds. Bianca Quijano will tell us why. Filipinos from all over Canada gathered in Toronto to show support in the changes brought forth by President Rodrigo Duterte, specifically in the rehabilitation of drug dependents who surrendered to authorities. Ang unang uh, tema talaga namin dito, Oplan Padala. So, 
tutulong din kami doon sa mga na-rehab. Ayan, ipapadala namin itong, uh, I hope, umabot ito ng limang, limang box na balikbayan. Around 100 supporters from all over the country attended this special gathering. Participants also attended a reception featuring many activities such as parlor games. In spite of criticisms being thrown against the president and General Bato, Filipino Canadians here have not lost faith and are still championing the administration. Also in attendance is Filipino Canadian Senator Tobias and Verga Jr., who addressed the crowd and gave some advice when it comes to spreading information, specifically on social media sites. So, and uh, with, with regards to the different stories roaming around. I, 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 I am urging everybody, I'm urging all the good citizens uh, to just make sure that you double check what you're reading and make sure you verify whatever is in there. Filipinos in Canada are still devoted to prosperity and change in the Philippines and many see them possible with President Duterte at the helm of the government. Bianca Quijano, UNTV News and Rescue, Toronto, Canada. Philippine Airlines or PAL has prohibited the use of Samsung Galaxy Note 7 on board all its flights starting today following the recent recall of these products due to safety issues. According to PAL on their official Facebook page, safety remains a cornerstone of its operations. Thus, it will be ensuring full compliance on board each flight. PAL says passengers may hand carry their Samsung Galaxy Note 7 devices as long as these are switched off at all times. In addition, the, these units are not allowed as check-in items nor accepted as PAL cargo shipment. Findings show that the Galaxy Note 7 batteries and phone units have caught fire during charging which prompted Samsung Electronics Company Limited to recall all units sold worldwide. The U.S. Forest Service has expressed gratitude to members Church of God International or MCGI and the UNTV Serbisyong Kasangbahay Group. Jun Soriao tells us why. Visitors of Millard Campground can now experience a cleaner environment around the favorite camping and hiking site at the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. The Millard Campground, located in Los Angeles, California, is among the preferred spot by families and friends to relax and to bond together. It is also a perfect place for nature lovers and picnics or a site where one can stroll around to get away from the busy city of Los Angeles. But because of the large number of visitors that regularly stroll around the Millard, the camping site is no longer clean than it was before. This has prompted the Gabriel Mountains National Monument Rangers to seek the help of volunteers to clean the site. Of course, the budgets, you know, they always get reduced and ours is uh, one that has been reduced and we just don't have the manpower to take care of things like this. We need to, um, we need to ask for community support um, and these type of volunteer groups are just great. In response, the Members Church of God International or MCGI in cooperation with the UNTV Servision Kasang Bahay Group sent volunteers to help in the cleanup drive around the Millard Campground. The U.S. Forest Service in return has thanked the MCGI and the UNTV for the huge number of volunteers it sent. We're leaving this legacy for um, the people, the little ones, that they're following us. So basically we need to set an example so they can keep on working for what we're doing. The MCGI and UNTV volunteers cleared the surroundings painted the walls and cleared the eroded soil in parking areas and campground. They also cleared fallen tree branches to prevent road accidents and obstructions as well as forest fires. Jun Suriao for Serbisyong Kasang Bahay. Thousands of New Yorkers gathered to mark the 9-11 attacks 15 years after it took place. The fall of the Twin Towers, which is said to be the worst terrorist attack in the history of the United States of America killed almost 3,000 people. U.S. President Barack Obama addressed the crowd from the Pentagon, emphasizing unity among Americans in spite of the tragedy. We remember and we will never forget the nearly 3,000 beautiful lives taken from us so cruelly. But in the end, the most enduring memorial to those we lost is ensuring 
the America that we continue to be, that we do not let others divide us. Out of many, we are one. For we know that our diversity, our patchwork heritage is not a weakness. It is still and always will be one of our greatest strengths. The horrifying memories of the 9-11 attacks is not stopping government operations in New York City. Sonny Koss will tell us why. The U.S. federal government markets return to the rebuilt One World Center, moving its New York City offices back to Lower Manhattan 15 years after the September 11 attacks that had reduced the site to rubble. Today is meant to be an uplifting day, a sign of our determination to move forward. Literally out of the ashes, we have rebuilt stronger and taller. Also known as the Freedom Tower, the 104-story One World Center is the tallest skyscraper in the Western Hemisphere at 1,776 feet or 541 meters. Construction began in 2006 and the building opened in 2014 when media company Condé Nast, the anchor tenant, moved in. About 67% of its 3 million square feet is now leased. The federal government was one of the first tenants in the original World Trade Center in the 1970s. The General Services Administration had leased the space at 6 World Trade Center before it was destroyed in the September 11, 2001 attacks. More than 1,000 employees of the GSA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and U.S. Customs and Border Patrol had moved into the space by March. The lease for the approximately 220,000 square feet is $15 million per year. Still, not everyone was happy about the return of government agencies to the building. In 2015, six GSA employees sued to try to block the move, saying they feared the rebuilt tower would again be a target for possible attacks. A federal judge in Manhattan threw out the case in June. The General Services Administration signed the lease on behalf of the government in 2012, making the government the third tenant in the new building. Sonicus, UNTV News and Rescue, New York. Days after the ASEAN summit in Laos, China once again meets with the 10 ASEAN member nations in Guangxi, Zhuang, Southern China in this year's Trade Expo. Dulce Alarcon will tell us why. The 13th China ASEAN Expo kicked off Sunday in Nanning, capital of South China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. It is co-sponsored by China and the 10 ASEAN countries. Since its first event in 2004, the Expo has been serving as an important platform to promote trade and relationships between China and the ASEAN, or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. 13th Expo will run until Wednesday and is expected to further advance mutual investment between China and the ASEAN countries in the key areas of industrial capacity cooperation and equipment manufacturing. This year's event sees 2,670 exhibiting companies, the largest number in participants in its decade-long history, according to the event secretariat, with more than 1,650 Chinese companies and 1,020 overseas companies joining the exhibition. Vietnam is the honorary country of this year's CA Expo. Bahui,更大的作用 China ASEAN trade rose to 472.16 billion US dollars in 2015 from 7.96 billion US dollars in 1991 with an annual growth rate of 18.5%. 2016 marks the 25th anniversary of China ASEAN relation. China is the biggest trading partner while ASEAN is China's third biggest. Dulce Alarcon, UNTV News and Rescue, Changchun, China. 
coming up. South Korea and the United States discuss security issues following threats of another nuke test from Pyongyang. Typhoon Ferdi maintains strength as it moves towards Batanes, while another tropical storm is expected to enter the Philippine area of responsibility by Wednesday. And Dutch free diver Janine Grass Mayer breaks the world record of fellow Russian in free immersion diving. More from Y News after this break. Typhoon Ferdi is, is continuously moving towards extreme northern Luzon. As of 4 p.m. today, the tropical cyclone was located at 780 kilometers east of Aparia, Cagayan. It moves west-northwest at 20 kilometers per hour, packed with maximum sustained winds of 185 kilometers per hour near the center and gustiness of up to 220 kilometers per hour. Tropical cyclone warning signal number one is raised over Cagayan, northern Isabela, Kalinga, Apayao, Ilocos Norte, Batanes, and Babuyan group of islands. These areas will experience rains and gusty winds within 36 hours. All types of sea vessels are not allowed to venture out over Bashi and Balintang channels due to very rough seas. Ferdi is expected to be in the vicinity of Batanes by Wednesday morning. The cyclone is also expected to intensify the southwest monsoon that will affect Luzon and Visayas, especially the western section starting tomorrow. Meanwhile, another tropical cyclone is expected to enter par by Wednesday and it will be named Henel. South Korea and the U.S. senior officials sat in a bilateral defense forum in Seoul today to discuss security issues, particularly in the Korean Peninsula. Eric Ferrer will tell us why. Days after North's fifth and most powerful nuclear blast to date, the true widespread condemnation, the South Korean government confirmed that the North is always ready for an additional nuclear test and might use a previously unused tunnel at its mountainous test sites in Pungiri area. Thus, South Korea and U.S. senior officials held a bilateral defense forum in Seoul today in an annual dialogue between the two countries to discuss several security issues, including North Korea's threat. The United States remains committed to the defense of the ROK um, uh, against the uh, North Korean threat uh, with all aspects of conventional missile defense uh, and nuclear capability. Meanwhile, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe told senior military officials that he absolutely cannot tolerate North Korea having conducted two nuclear tests since the start of the year. North Korea said on Sunday, a push for further sanctions following its latest nuclear test was laughable and vowed to continue to strengthen its nuclear power. North Korea has been testing different types of missiles at an unprecedented rate this year, and the capability to mount a nuclear warhead is worrisome for its neighbors South Korea and Japan, and worst, Asia and the world. Eric Ferrer, UNTV News and Rescue, South Korea. Clinics and healthcare workers struggle to help Haiti's cholera victims as numbers rise due to reductions in funding. Robbie Domingo, Robbie de Guzman will tell us why. 
UN-led foreign funding has dried up for Haiti's fight against cholera, thought to have been introduced by Nepali peacekeepers, triggering a surge of deaths this year even as the global body vowed to help overcome the epidemic. The lack of support is notable because Haiti was free of cholera until 2010, when according to investigators, UN peacekeepers dump infected sewage into a river. Since then, more than 9,000 people have died of the disease that causes uncontrollable diarrhea, and 800,000 people have fallen ill, mostly in the first two years of the outbreak. The United Nations has not legally accepted responsibility for the outbreak. An independent panel appointed by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon issued a 2011 report that did not determine conclusively how the cholera was introduced to Haiti. However, a new report by the independent UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights concluded that scientific evidence now points overwhelmingly to the responsibility of the peacekeeping mission as the source of the outbreak. Ban, whose successor will be elected by the General Assembly, launched a major appeal aimed at eradicating cholera in Haiti four years ago. But foreign governments largely ignore the plea, and funding has almost halved to $7.9 million in 2016 from a year ago. Jean Ludovic Mittenier is the deputy representative of UNICEF in Haiti and said the situation is serious and is likely to get worse. Aujourd'hui, la baisse des fonds combinée à la hausse de la pluviométrie fait que le vibrion choléra se propage et que le nombre de personnes qui sont touchées par l'épidémie a augmenté de manière conséquente au mois de mai-juin, ce qui fait que nous avons été obligés de trouver des ressources additionnelles pour augmenter le nombre d'équipes pour intervenir là où des flambées de choléra sont identifiées. D'une flambée importante du choléra, si une nouvelle approche n'est pas mise en place rapidement, from January to July, nearly 25,000 cholera cases were registered, a 22% rise over the same period last year. In 2012, Ben launched a $2.2 billion funding drive aimed at eradicating the disease from Haiti within a decade. Documents from the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reports that so far, the campaign has only raised 18% of the target from international donors. Ben has vowed a new approach due to be unveiled in October. Robbie de Guzman, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Dutch free diver Janine Grasmeyer breaks the world record in free immersion diving. Meanwhile, spectators at a theme park in Songqing in the southwestern part of China have something new to visit. Nina Armilio will tell us why. A one-month-old sea lion begins to show off its natural gift of performing in the water at a theme park in the municipality of Chongqing in southwest China. The male sea lion is the 13th to be born through artificial breeding at the theme park. The 8-year-old mother sea lion is the principal performer of the theme park. The baby sea lion seems to have inherited its mother's gift of performance according to Zhu Wei, the sea lion's trainer. Meanwhile, 23-year-old Janine Grasmeyer is the new world record holder for free immersion diving. She sank down to 92 meters below the surface of Bonaire in the Caribbean, was unaided by flippers, and stayed underwater for 3 minutes and 46 seconds. The record was previously held by Russia's Natalia Molkanova, with 91 meters down below, who disappeared while making a dive in the Mediterranean last year. Quite happy and quite proud. On the other hand, I also know that she will not be able to take it back anymore, uh, like she used to. Like she was always able to break any world records in any discipline in within any amount of time. She was that good. The new record has been ratified by the official Guinness World Record Organization. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. 
third seed Stan Wawrinka won the U.S. Open on Sunday, September 11, after beating defending champion Novak Djokovic in four sets 6-7, 6-4, 7-5, and 6-3. During the four-hour final match that featured long rallies and brilliant shot-making from both players, the 31-year-old Swiss was better on the most important points. Wawrinka crashed in on six of ten break points opportunities and saved 14 of 17 break points against Djokovic. This third Grand Slam title of Rorinka was worth $3.5 million. He is only missing a Wimbledon victory to complete the coveted career Grand Slam. Artemis Racing Team round out the weekend with a celebration, while Colombia Nairo Quintana is confident to beat Chris Froome in next year's Tour of Spain. Aaron Romero tells us why. Colombian Nairo Quintana concluded his maiden Vuelta victory after safely rolling in to Madrid at the end of a three-week battle with Chris Froome. The 26-year-old cyclist becomes his country's first Vuelta victor since Lucho Herrera in 1987. Quintana adds the victory to his win in the Giro two years ago. In the BMW Championship, Dustin Johnson clinched a three-stroke victory beating Englishman Paul Casey and fellow American Roberto Castro. The U.S. Open champion continued the best year of his career, carding 67 to finish at 23 under par 265 at Crooked Stick in Carmel, Indiana. And as the 2016 Rio Paralympic Games continue, Germany's Martin Schulz becomes the first triathlon winner as the triathlon event makes its debut. Canada's Stefan Daniel took silver Jairo Luis Lopez of Spain won the bronze medal. In the women's F20 shot put, Poland's Ewa Durska successfully defended her F20 title at the Olympic Stadium, breaking her own record in the process with a throw of 13.94 meters. Mexican powerlifter Amalia Perez lifted a world record of 130 kilograms to win the women's 55 kilogram category. The 43-year-old who won gold in Beijing in the 52-kilogram category and London in the 60-kilogram event also won silver in Sydney and Athens. And in swimming, China's Su Ping secured his third gold medal after winning the men's 50 meters S6 race. Su, who has won 10 Paralympic gold medals in his career, aims to add to that tally in the 200 meters individual medley. In sail racing, Sweden's Artemis racing team held on to their lead to emerge triumphant in the Louis Vuitton America's Cup World Series event in Toulon. SoftBank Team Japan finishes second while Britain's Land Rover Bar team completed the event on the third spot. Aaron Romero, UNTV News and Rescue, New York. The Bureau of Customs Transformers is definitely a team to watch out for in the UNTV Cup Season 5. Bernard Dadis will tell us why. The newest team in the league, the Bureau of Customs Transformers, emerged as the victor in yesterday's game versus the GSIS Furies after a neck-and-neck -neck battle on the UNTB Cup Season 5 hardcourt with a final score 76-74. The Transformers was led by no other than the skyscraper himself, Marlo Aquino, who was also hailed as the best player of the game for bucketing 12 points and grabbing 9 rebounds. Also with big contributions for the team's victory are Samuel Ignacio, who buried a two points worth of shot, giving a significant two-point lead in the last 10 seconds in the ball game. Playing coach Kenneth Remdes was very satisfied with the team's gameplay. Ito yung maganda sa NTV, uh, maganda yung games, and uh, we have our lapses in the game. Uh, the end of the uh, the end of the game, end game na meron kami mga nagrelay kami on experience. So, maraming pa kami uh, dapat adjust, especially on our defense. Uh, 
thank God na na-survive namin tong GSISS. It's a tough game, tough team. The BOC Transformers, led by the Bureau of Customs Commissioner Nicanor Faildon, is confident that the team will be able to sustain their triumph in the only basketball league for public servants. Uh, salamat sa UNTV sa uh, sa lahat ng sumusuporta ng liga. Uh, Siyempre masaya dahil nanalo tayo sa first game. Uh, sana tuloy-tuloy. The GSIS Furies, on the other hand, vows to recover from its loss in its following games. Bernard Daddies for UNTV Cup Season 5. Those are the reasons behind the news. September 12, 2016. Mangelo Castro III. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Jerry Alcantara. And I'm Darlene Basingan because we need to know... We will always ask why. Thank you for watching Why News.